created? It was created by um, an unknown individual or a group of individuals, Satoshi Nakamoto, and in 2008 as an electronic money that could be transferred easily and cheaply between two individuals. Um, the, uh, does anyone have any, do you have, do you have any cash? I have a few coins. You got a few coins? Does, it, does anyone have a bill? A bill? Okay, so, thank you, Mike. So Mike and I have now just engaged in a peer-to-peer -peer transaction, right? One person to one person, he's giving me money. It's completely anonymous. There's no way to record this transaction. Except and on video. Except on the video. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's what's interesting is if you never if you never really looked at your Canadian dollars, you'll notice that there's apart from all the, the features that are for anti counterfeiting, there's actually a unique identifier on each bill which is the serial number on the back, okay? And the serial number is actually recorded on a centralized ledger that's maintained by the entity that keep, controls this, the Bank of Canada. Now, who is the Bank of Canada? Who's the, what, what is the Bank of Canada's job, Keith? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm calling on you. Regulate the money supply? Yeah. Regulate the money supply, right. Yesterday there was a big announcement. The governor, Stephen Poloff, was talking about interest rates, whether they're going to raise interest rates. One of the functions of the Bank of Canada is to maintain the money supply. Okay. Now, they keep a centralized ledger. It is electronic. And if there was ever any question about the, uh, the validity or the, uh, this note, it could be checked against this registration number, right? That's how they avoid counterfeiting. And just to make sure that people trust it, it's actually got two signatures on it. Do you see the signatures on it? Mm -hmm. um, I can't really read them, though. I know, you can't even read them, but they're there. Mm -hmm. One is the governor of the Bank of Canada, one's the senior deputy governor. And I think this is actually Mark Carney, who used to be the governor, right? So, uh, thank you, Mike. So the, the idea behind Bitcoin is to try and create an electronic version of what we've just done, which is to allow people to have a means of payment that they could transfer peer to peer, but no longer to have a centralized authority that would be recording it and controlling both the quantity that's available as well as the, the recording of the transactions. Okay. Now, the problem with uh, doing this electronically is that when you do it physically, I have the bill, Mike doesn't have the bill, we know who has the bill. Electronically, there's a problem that you could send it to two people at the same time. And this is known as the double spend problem. Okay. How do you ensure that when somebody sends you a Bitcoin, they haven't already sent it and spent it to someone else? Okay. And this, uh, so uh, Satoshi Nakamoto was not the first person to come up with an electronic money. There was actually one back in 1997, but they couldn't get around this problem of the double spend problem. So what was revolutionary about this idea was that he, he published a paper, and it's only a nine-page paper. If you're interested in this, I highly recommend you read it because it's very straightforward. It basically explains a way to get around this double spend problem by using timestamps and something called hashing. Okay? And the idea is we're going to have one ledger that's public that anyone can look at, and it's going to have an identifier for each Bitcoin an identifier, a public key for whoever owns it, and a timestamp for when they acquired it. Okay. And when they transfer it, we're simply going to append the new public key of the individual that receives it, and so and a timestamp, and we're going to be able to see, everyone can see who actually owns each and every Bitcoin. Okay. So the ledger that holds this is called the blockchain. The reason it's called the blockchain is because the transactions that are going to be uh, that are going to be verified are going to be done in batches or blocks. Okay, so if you think of a physical paper ledger, you have pages on a ledger. Okay, well the blockchain, each block is like a page that's being has a list of all the transactions that happened over the previous ten minutes, and it's going to be electronically tied to the previous page. Okay, using something called a hash. Now, you can record on a blockchain any asset. It just so happens that the first use case was Bitcoin, and the only asset that's recorded on, the, on this ledger is Bitcoin. Okay, you don't see what's on the other side of a transaction. Okay, so um, you know if you if you own shares in a company, 
Okay, uh, what's the biggest publicly listed company in Saskatchewan? Is it Potash Corp? Okay, so how does Potash Corp, I'm gonna ask you, because why not? <laughs> how does Potash Corp know who their shareholders are? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> they don't know, I mean, probably lots of people, right? Yes. And not only here in Saskatchewan, but around Canada and the rest of the world? Right. Okay, why, you know, why, uh, Joe, why would Potash Corp need to know who their shareholders are? For several purposes. One is for dividend payment. They need to know where the money goes. Number two, they want to understand who is owning this company. Yeah. So it's important. They have to actually uh, send out money to these people on a regular basis. And once a year, they have to have a vote. And everybody who owns a share in Potash Corp has, has a vote. Okay? Well, this ledger is, is held electronically. And all it records is the ownership of Potash shares. It doesn't show what you paid for it. It just shows your name, how many shares, and a timestamp when you bought it. That's exactly what the Bitcoin blockchain does. Okay? It records ownership of Bitcoin when you, which coins, and when you acquired them. Okay? Now, the thing is, by having a big public ledger mm -hmm. that everybody can download, you have to have a way to agree on who gets to update the ledger. Okay? Because obviously, you could create fraud if you could just get in and change the ledger. So, there's going to be several pieces to to this puzzle. Okay, there's actually five things behind Bitcoin. The first one I mentioned is this, this decentralized public ledger, and, and this is a particular, you can think of it as an Excel database. Okay, an Excel database with a bunch of columns recording ownership of the coins, except it is, um, it is actually permissionless, which means anyone can get a copy, and it's distributed, meaning that there are multiple copies of the identical ledger so any of us here could download the Bitcoin software, and with that software, we would get the, the most recent up-to-date ledger. Now, if you think about it, that ledger has to be updated on a regular basis, and all of our copies have to be identical. So what happens is every 10 minutes, when they add a new block of transactions, it goes around through the network, and if more than 50% of the ledgers have the same information, that is, that is viewed as the truth. Everybody's ledger is rewritten so that it has exactly the same information. And the ledger is then locked at that point using cryptography. And the way that you do that is, is through something called hashing. And when I say hash, I don't mean something that you smoke or something that you put in a brownie. I mean a, a way of converting data into an encrypted form. Okay, and I'll show you some hashing in a minute. You have a network of computers, and everybody who has a computer on this network is called a node. And you have certain people who are super users, or whose job it is to, to verify transactions, and to maintain the ledger, and they're called miners. Okay? And those miners are going to have to be rewarded, because by, they're going to be providing a service to the Bitcoin network. Yeah. Who gets to choose miners? Anyone can be a miner. Okay, what we're going to see is that anyone can be a miner. It's a question of, um, of running a, a software program on your computer and being the one who happens to solve a, a puzzle or a problem that happens once every 10 minutes. Just okay, as and I'm going to show that puzzle. I'm going to talk about that in a second. To add to that, yeah. there are some cryptocurrencies where you can't determine yourself to be a miner and it's centrally controlled. That's right. So what we're going to see is that from one cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, there are now over 1,500. Some of them are pre-mined and pre-sold. Others have this kind of reward system where the number of coins are being created all the time. You have to have a digital signature, and you're going to have both a public and a private key. So like your username and your password, your username is going to be how you identify yourself on this ledger, and your private password is going to be something that you don't share with anyone, because with your password, they could they could access your account and, and lose your coins. Okay. Who, who, determines, who determines the value of your Bitcoin? So who is determining you? Okay, so let me ask you, Arturo. Um, how much is that pen you're holding in your hand worth? Okay, do you, does anyone want to buy Arturo's pen? What did you say it was worth? 50 cents. 50 cents. Do I, see, do I hear 50? <laughs> okay, so do I hear 60? 65? 60? Okay, so... Behind you, the gentleman is willing to pay 60 cents for your pen. How did we determine that? 
supply and demand. So Bitcoin is purely the product of supply and demand. I like to uh, I like to say that the value of Bitcoin is the same as the value of a used stamp. Some people view used stamps as as like pieces of paper that have no value, and some people will look at used stamp and say it's worth a million dollars. So the question is, what makes a used stamp worth a million dollars? Well, you can't lick it and put it on a, a, another letter. So it doesn't have actually any practical purpose. It's a piece of art and people ascribe value to it. So the value of, why, what gives Canadian dollars value? What, why, why do we believe that the five dollar note then, that might? Because we agree on it. We agree that yeah, it yeah. should be worth some sort of basket of goods and services. But it's back, back to it could be, right? It could be, but the promise is, what's the promise? Is there any gold behind the Canadian dollar? Not anymore. No. Not anymore, right? So there's the government's pledge that it is worth $5. What happened in Venezuela over the recent months to their currency? Uh, horrible inflation. Horrible inflation, right? Because people lost lost value, lost confidence in the in the, the currency because of inflation in Venezuela. So suddenly a currency that people were exchanging quite freely lost value and then the government replaced it with a new currency and now people have lost trust in, in the Venezuelan government and they're holding US dollars. Okay. So money is like very much based on trust. So what Bitcoin has done is, is created trust using cryptography and transparency as an alternative to a centralized authority. Okay. But what gives it its value? It's what people think it's worth. So uh, there's no better answer than to say the value of a Bitcoin is what someone is willing to pay for. It. And ultimately it's what goods and services you can get or what so-called paper or fiat currency people are willing to exchange for it or other cryptocurrencies for it. And do you think that it could be um, a form of manipulation? Well, the way the system has been set up, it is um, by having it large, public, and open, and with a, a set of rules that are well understood, the design that Satoshi Nakamoto put in place was to incentivize people not to manipulate it, but to, to do the fair thing as opposed to trying to um, trying to uh, let's say undermine the value of Bitcoin. Having said that, since it was introduced in 2008, there have been lots of examples of where trust has been broken. But typically, it's been by financial intermediaries that have come into the system. So, in particular, exchanges. Okay, so. The idea was never, in the original paper, that two people would exchange cryptocurrencies over an exchange. The idea was always it was going to be one person to one person, peer to peer, from one computer to another computer. But that is quite difficult for many people who are not technologically savvy, so they put in between them uh, a digital wallet on your phone or an exchange like Quadriga or like a Mt. Gox. And those became places where people were able to hack and steal coins. But the ledger itself has not been hacked yet. The ledger itself is so-called immutable. And I'm going to explain how you keep the ledger secure right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah? To be a miner, do you need like special hardware or do you just need your computer and the software? Okay, so um, let me ask. You, um, you, you've been mining? Were you mining yourself? No. Mike, did you mine? Yeah. What did you need? Could you explain how? Well, when I first started out, uh, I needed graphics cards, specialized graphics cards. Mm -hmm. And I was mining the altcoins because the bitcoins were already using the ASICs. Yes. And field programming gate arrays and all that kind of stuff to uh, outcompete. And it became very corrupt. And I think that's one of the biggest problems why bitcoin is not easily distributed and requires centralized mines. Okay, so, centralized exchanges. So what Mike explained to you, when I first heard it, it sounded like I couldn't understand what he was talking about. Right? Because um, when, when uh, the original mining started happening in 2009, people were using a regular laptop and a regular processor, uh, a CPU. And basically, the, the CPU would be looking to solve a problem 
called, uh, it was basically trying to solve uh, a numerical problem to decide who would get, who would be able to verify the transactions and receive the reward. And that problem is called, uh, is a hashing. Okay. Now, the, the numerical problem using a CPU back in, at, at the start when there were a few people doing this, you could expect to get a coin about once a day. Right? But as Mike pointed out, graphics cards or GPUs, graphic processing units, are many, many times more powerful than CPUs. And so people quickly moved from a CPU to a GPU because then they would be able to run the algorithm many more times in, 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 in serially than a CPU. So people started uh, investing in more powerful computers. The actual problem itself is, is, quite, is quite easy, actually. The idea is we're going to agree on one type of algorithm, of which there are many hash algorithms. And we're going we're to use the SHA-256, the secure hash algorithm 256, where 256 refers to the number of bits that you're going to convert something into. Okay? The idea is you're going to take a, a bunch of transactions and you're going to throw it into this algorithm and it's going to convert it into a 256-bit representation. And the easiest way for me to show to do that is to show you, okay, if I take the word Regina and I go to a, a, a hash calculator online and I put the word <coughs> Regina into it, this is what the representation is. Okay, this is 256 bits or 64-byte representation made up of the letters A through F and the numbers 0 through 9. And as you can see here, this six-letter word with one capital has this representation. Anyone who puts the word Regina with a full capital R into the hash calculator will receive this, but it is impossible to back out what was used to create this if you don't know. Okay. So it's not an encryption decryption, it's a one-way encryption. Now, if I change this from a capital R to a lowercase r, and I put it into the hash algorithm, I get a, 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 a very different hash or 64-bit representation using this algorithm. And if I now add uh, a, a few more spaces and words, I will get a totally different representation. And what you see here is that because there are 16 possible characters for every position, there's a 1 in 16 chance of getting a B at the first position. And it, it just so happened that I happened to get one in both. The third time, I got a zero. And what the Bitcoin problem is, is to try and find a combination of transactions and a number that will generate a hash with a certain number of leading zeros. So you got a 1 in 16 chance of zero, to have one zero. You have 1 in 16 squared to get two zeros, 1 in 16 cubed to get three zeros. Okay. So the, the so-called problem is to try and find a number which added together with the previous hash from the previous block and all the transactions that are being verified, that number called a nonce, which when put into a hash algorithm will generate uh, a 256-bit representation that starts with a certain number of zeros. So there is no intelligence involved. There is no like answer or skill testing question. It is randomly look for a number called the nonce, which when combined with the transactions and thrown into the algorithm, gives you a specific hash. Okay. So at this point, you now realize that to win this, and, and if you do this, you will be rewarded, originally you were, you were rewarded 50 Bitcoins for doing this, for being the first. Didn't it start out at 100 even? Um, yeah, I think it started out at 100, and it, it's been having every four years. Because one of the specifications that was put out there was that there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins. And that they will be created on a regular basis every 10 minutes. Every block, one block every 10 minutes on average. And the, the reward for finding this, solving this hash before anyone else has been declining over time. So it's now at 12 and a half Bitcoins per block. Okay. So when Bitcoin was at $10,000, you would get, if you solved it, $125,000. Okay. So what would you do? 
we'll buy a bunch of computers, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but what it, what's it cost for you to have those computers? I imagine it would be cheap, maybe a couple thousand dollars. Maybe. Yeah, it costs you a couple thousand to get like the highest computers, right? What else? Um, They're running twenty four seven. Yeah. Power. Power. So you got to pay your electricity bill. And what else? Internet. Yeah. Access to internet. And yeah. And they make you pay here in Canada. Yeah. Exactly. And and cooling. Because if you have a, a laptop sitting on your, your 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 lap and it's running, it's putting out a lot of heat, and a processor that's running 24/7 is generating a lot of heat. So what happened was that initially people were using laptops, and then they were using GPUs on their laptops, and then they somebody invented a, a chip that doesn't do anything else. It doesn't do any graphics, doesn't do any displays, doesn't do any other calculation. All it does is run this algorithm. And it was called uh, an ASIC chip, ASIC, nothing to do with the Rangishu company. Okay. And the ASIC chips, when they hit the market, they, they could just do, I just did three hashes. Okay, you're going to see that the number of hashes we're talking about that are on the network are in the trillions of hashes per second. And the, the way that you can maximize your chances of being the one that finds, solves the hash is by having more computing power. And so this went from being something that people could do at home to then people uh, collaborating in groups called mining pools to industrial businesses set up in locations that have cold climates with cheap electricity. So Iceland, northern China, Quebec, uh, Russia, okay? And it's a it's a cost benefit. So I knew somebody in Victoria who I met who actually was hash who was doing this around the same time that, that Mike and the others started. And he he, he started mining uh, using a GPU and then he, he bought the next generation and then the next generation. But pretty soon the number of coins he was getting was going down and down and down because more and more people were looking and had bought more and more sophisticated computers. And he was finding that the number of coins he was getting was lower than his hydro bill. And at that point, he was smart enough to say, well, why should I mine coins when I can simply go out and buy them? And his hydro bill is like at 500 bucks a month. Now, that was back in 2014. So this is what a block actually looks like. I'm, I'm going to show you this is block 516,608. And you can see the previous block is one earlier, 607. This was the hash from the previous block. You notice that the hash here has about 12 leading zeros. This was actually mined on April 4th at 8.46 a.m. And these are the transactions that were included in this block, like another page on the ledger. And this was the, the number that was the winning number, the nonce. Okay. What date was that? This what was year? April 4th. What year? 2018. Okay. okay. And uh, the problem is, when, when uh, Bitcoin was set up, Satoshi artificially set a limit on the block size to one megabyte. Now, most of us can't visualize what would fit in a one megabyte block, okay? But if, you, if you're a computer scientist, you know how many bits will fit in a, in a, in a, in a, in a one megabyte block. A 64-bit representation, how much space is that? So the answer is you can get, you can get about 1,200 transactions into one block. Okay, and it used to be that there were fewer than 1,200 transactions every 10 minutes, so everybody's transactions were, were put into a block about every 10 minutes. Okay. Notice that the hash here is, is this one here. This hash is then put into the next block along with the next set of transactions that are in a pool waiting to be verified. And that pool is called the memory pool or the mempool, and it's just a whole bunch of transactions between different people and they're waiting for someone to actually put their transactions into a block and for it to be verified on the network. Okay. Notice that the very first transaction in every one is the reward that the miner got who was able to solve it. So 12 and a half coins uh, in this case. Okay. okay, so this is what it looks like. And you can think of the blocks as being kind of like linked like a chain together, which is why it's called the blockchain. Yeah. 
I don't know, maybe you're going to be doing ex explaining this next, but uh, can you explain, you know, the like the bitcoins that are awarded to the miners at the completion of the block, but what about the miner fee? Okay. Yeah, How does I'm that gonna kind get, of so interact with the, the interesting whole process? The thing is that, what, yeah, so the way the system was set up, miners would do this only to be rewarded by the creation of a block. But once you started getting to uh, a capacity constraint where there was more transactions that needed to be processed than could fit in one block, how could you get yourself to the front of the queue? Well, you could voluntarily offer a fee to a miner to put your transaction in their block. Because, okay? you know, to it doesn't matter which transactions you prove, you put in. It's just any combination of transactions with the previous hash and, and a nonce that, that meets the specified difficulty level. So they have a choice. So if one transaction offers no fee and another transaction offers a fee, miners quickly wrote software that would maximize like the, the amount of fees that they would receive in addition to the, the, the block board. And when you think about it, once all the coins are created, Okay, this is the number of coins that have been created as of January 2019. You see that they started zero in 2009. They're now up to 18 million, and they're 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 going at relatively straight fashion. Once they get to 21 million, there will no longer be a mining fee, a mining reward, because no more coins will be created. So the system has developed a fee structure where miners are being rewarded by receiving a small slice of every Bitcoin that they process. And you can offer more or less voluntarily depending on your demand for immediacy. Yeah. So you said it started out at zero at the beginning of 2019, so it doesn't reset yeah. every single year? No. Nope. The number of coins in circulation, once a coin is created, it create. It, this is... Uh, oh, uh, that's 09. Oh, yeah, 09, yeah. Okay. What, what the, the line shows the number of, of coins in circulation. This gray spot on the other axis shows um, the difficulty of finding that hash. And as you can see here, back in at this point, the difficulty was already at one trillion and, and going up. And this is directly related to the number of people who have downloaded the software and the amount of commuting power that's, that's looking for this. So it stops at 21 million, you said? Yes. Okay. okay. So after that, then there's no more mining. There's no more mining reward. Sure. Okay. All that will exist is the fee that you get for for, for processing transactions. Okay. Was that implemented after? Like, did Satoshi actually implement the miner fee, or no, was that didn't. after? He didn't. It's been. It's the way that the market is adapted. Oh, okay. So okay. And it, if you think about it, it's a way that the system has somehow become perverted. I think uh, the original intention. It might be important to note that uh, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. The, uh, the mining reward doesn't tap out to like 2050 or something. 2140. 2140, yeah. yeah. So not for quite a while. 2140 is when the last coins will be minted. Yeah. Oh. But at that point, you have to be worried about like, you know, supply and demand will, will drive the fee. Notice that um, um, for, for those of you who are like used to books and libraries, does anyone know what this picture is of? Okay, what, at the back there, what's your name? Martha. Martha, what is this? <laughs> that I currently have when you check out the book. The yeah, it used to be this piece of paper inside the cover of a book that would show that you checked it up. And what's interesting is that it, uh, this is actually the complete poems of E. e. Cummings. And that's too, too difficult uh, for our old computer systems to actually record. So they came up with a, a way of coming up with a digital representation of every single book called the Dewey Decimal System. And and this is what the Dewey Decimal System's record for this book was, and it was a universal identifier for this book. And you would basically stamp the date and sign your name, and you could see everybody who had had the book before you and at what point they had it. So this is kind of a physical ledger. Okay. Well, this is effectively what the blockchain does for Bitcoin. It just does it electronically. But everyone can see who's had it. Instead of having your real name, you just have your pseudo identity. And you'll have a timestamp and it'll show that you had the you had the book. Okay? Or a coin in this case. Okay. 
Does it show the sender and the receiver on blockchain? Yep. For every coin, it shows who had it and then who had it next. So if you think of, um, um, does anyone here own a house? Okay, so, you know, who owned your house before you? Uh, no one. Before no one. We built it. Okay, so you built it. So if you ever sell it, right, the, the next person will know who they bought it from. Right. Who's bought an older house? Uh, who is the, do you know the owner who bought it before you? I know their name only. Do you know who owned it before them? No. Okay, so most of the time we only know like one person. With the Bitcoin you can see all the way back to the date when it was created, every single identifier of who's owned it. The thing is, it's a pseudo identity because it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 um, a uh, everybody should have a unique identifier, but it doesn't let, you don't know who's behind it. Okay. So the, the idea of the ledger is, um, okay, so well, it's, it's quite interesting because this is now the value of Bitcoins from 2009 until end of 2012. And you'll notice that the scale goes from zero to $35, $35 for a Bitcoin. And you'll see that the Bitcoins went up in 2011 to as high as $35 and then crashed. Does anyone know what was that? What was that event? This is kind of like Mount a Gox. very important event in the last The Mount Gox uh, hack. The Mount Gox hack. Oh, okay. So uh, some, as more and more people were mining coins, they were finding it difficult to 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 um, to record and hold and to trade. So an enterprising young man in Japan set up an exchange, a virtual exchange, in Tokyo called Mount Gox. And all he did was allow people to buy and sell coins on the exchange that he created. And the thing is, when you buy and sell on an exchange, the coins technically sit on the, belong to the exchange. Okay, so all the coins were under the name of Mt. Gox that people who were trading on the exchange had. And what happened was somebody realized it would be a lot easier than mining coins to simply hack the exchange. And so they hacked the exchange and they stole all the coins that were being held at Mt. Gox. And because the ledger is public and transparent, everyone could see who did it. <laughs> all of the coins now show the same identifier at, that, that were held at Mt. Gox. The problem is you just don't know who's behind it. Okay. You can see how many coins Satoshi holds. Because the very first block created, he created it, so you know what his unique identifier is, and you can search through the ledger and find all the coins that he owns, or she, or they. Yeah. Did they arrest the person? No, because the, the identity is anonymous. Right? And could this is unregulated. It, could they trace it somehow? Ah, well, maybe the Israeli secret service could, but you know, most people know. <laughs> Isn't there some ability to trace through yeah. IPs and stuff like that? Yeah, so, you know, computers have a unique identifier, yeah. and yes, you know, there is some question about whether you can uh, you can trace it to a com particular computer. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But as soon as you take it offline yeah. and trash the computer, yeah. so taking it offline means putting it onto a USB key. Yeah. And one of the first things, one of the one of the brilliant people in the early days who started up a mining pool mining arts was the founder of the Slush Pool. He actually came up with the first secure USB key that had uh, dual factor authentication. So that you, and they call that a cold storage, right? And you would take take that and just don't lose it. I've heard of people losing them and like they have hundreds of coins on them. Well, yeah, unless they use like an, what would happen if they use an internet cafe computer? Wouldn't that pretty much mean that they're AWOL? Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah. You, it's you, very hard to find anyone using a computer. It's the same thing. You may have this pseudo identity, but. Yeah, you <laughs> take your coins can... offline, you destroy the computer, like the trail goes cold. Right? Now, if somebody next to you starts buying like a lot of furniture and <laughs> cars and stuff, maybe. Okay, so now this shows the, the price of Bitcoin for 2013 up to modern day, uh, sorry, current time. And you can see here that this little small blip here is the Mt. Cox, right? When it hit $35. Now the scale goes up to 20,000 US. And you can see that in October through December of last in 2017 was when it ran up and it hit around $20,000. And it has subsequently fallen back down to around $4,000. 
And you can see here the, the, the amount of hashes per second. It used to be five trillion hashes per second here, up to 15 trillion hashes per second. Now we're talking 10 million trillion hashes per second, up to 50 million trillion hashes per second. So the amount of computing power that's being used has now gone exponential. And there's a website that records how much energy is actually being consumed on an annual basis. And currently, I believe, it's about equivalent to the total energy users of Switzerland. Okay? And that's all people running the algorithm, trying to find the nonce, get the coin reward. That's all they're doing. So many people would say that this is a tremendous waste of, of resources and value. Okay? So the problem was that because of the fee system that's been introduced, it now has become particularly expensive to confirm and, and time consuming a Bitcoin transaction. So what's happened is people have said, well, why don't we just change the block size? Why don't we just change uh, you know, uh, some of the rules, the number of coins that could be created? And in order to do that, under the original rules, there has to be a vote, and more than 50% of the holders of Bitcoin have to agree to it, and more than 50% of the people do not want to do that. So you can take your Bitcoin and you can go your own way, and that's called a fork. And one of the very first forks that happened was they took a bunch of Bitcoin holders, created something called Bitcoin Cash, and they they, they basically they started a new ledger with a new a new uh, size and price, and now you have Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin that trade in parallel with each other, but have different features, but they have the same origin, so it's like a tree with branches going up. And in fact, Bitcoin is forked about 15 to 20 times. People have created, they, there's been different breakoff groups. So it's worse than religion. <laughs> okay. So um, just to summarize, Bitcoin is the first decentralized currency. It's actually recorded on a distributed ledger called the blockchain. People race to, to, to confirm transactions by solving a problem and they get rewarded. And this, this race is called proof of work and it is expensive and time consuming. Uh, if you are the one that solves it, you get the reward, and the reward is being halved. And, and the, the, the difficulty of finding it is adjusted such that a coin is created only about, a new block is only, uh, is only locked every 10 minutes, and that after 21 million coins, there will be no more coins created. So now we come to the world of cryptocurrencies. Yeah? So what's the main reason why the value of Bitcoin crashed in Many people have studied bubbles in assets. And the thing is, you can usually tell when there's a bubble. You just don't know when the bubble is going to burst <laughs> because it's not necessarily rational. So what we saw with Bitcoin price was a bubble. And the, the question is, is the real value, the true value to the users $4,000 or $10,000? Well, the market has decided. Now. What's interesting is that it's very easy to create alternatives to Bitcoin because Satoshi put the code for creating this on GitHub, which is a public, uh, publicly available code database, and anyone who wanted it could download it, and they could change the code and they could launch a new coin. So people just launched new coins with different features and different use cases, and those coins, because they're all based on a, a blockchain ledger that's cryptographically secured, they're known as alternatives to Bitcoin or altcoins. Okay. Okay. And you can see here that uh, this is a, a, a website called coinmarketcap.com. I'm just showing you the top 10 coins. This is back in October 2017. At that point, there was 1,100 cryptocurrencies traded on over 5,000 exchanges with a market cap of 165 billion. Uh, Bitcoin, the daily volume of turnover was $5 billion, of which Bitcoin represented 47%. 54% for me. And at that point, when I first gave this talk, Bitcoin was worth 5400 okay. Now, I unfortunately didn't give this talk again until uh, January. By that point, Bitcoin was now had tripled from five to 15000 The The market cap had, had gone up to $740 billion, and two more, 200 more cryptocurrencies had been created. 
and 2,500 more markets have been launched. And you can see here that some of them have very interesting names. Uh, we heard about uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. We heard about Ripple or XRP. I mentioned Bitcoin Cash. There's something called Litecoin. Uh, my favorite is, is Tron, just because like, you know, I'm a, a movie geek and you know, I like the Tron. But there are, there are many different coins and typically all it took to launch a new coin was to have a white paper online. You would have, you'd say, what is the purpose of this coin? People would subscribe and buy the coins in an initial offering of coins, called an initial coin offering or an ICO. And you would basically buy it purely based on your belief that it's going to have value in the future. Okay. So all of these are under the name cryptocurrency, you know, correct? Yeah. So they're all classified as cryptocurrencies. And it, it, it started becoming a little more confusing because now, in addition to coins, you have something called tokens. Okay, now this. Um, the, the best example I use for tokens is that if you ever go to Toronto and you ride the subway system, you need a, a subway token, right? So, or you go to New York, you used to need a physical subway token. Tokens are basically a digital version of that that gives you access to some product or service. So you could buy a token and you could use it, for example, to, um, to pay for a service online, such as a designer may provide a graphic design for you. Okay? And they may say, I'm only accepting tokens for my payment. So, um, like, is it Litecoin that's uh, basically trading a spare uh, computing capacity on, on on computers? Is that uh, Litecoin? EOS, maybe. Yeah. Who who is it that owns Litecoin? Owns Litecoin. I own Litecoin. What's the use case for Litecoin? Uh, Charlie Lee said it's going to be, or supposedly the silver to Bitcoin's gold. So it's, uh, I think it's a four megabyte block size. Okay. Like it's, it's, and there's 41 million cap or something like that. But yeah. it, it's basically a lighter version of Bitcoin, which will be a faster and cheaper tr transaction. Okay. So, it, it, you know, some of these actually have a, a business purpose behind them. They're talking about like Gollum, where they're yeah. trading computer power for, yes, Gollum, you know, sure. like high, uh, whatever, like weather modeling or whatever. So they're using the tokens to buy computer power on the decentralized network. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm going to talk about Ethereum in a moment because Ethereum is quite different in in spirit to Bitcoin, and it's quite uh, different. All I want to show now is actually what happened uh, by by yesterday. So notice that by by yesterday. Bitcoin's value is down to $4,000, but the number of cryptocurrencies, despite bans on the creation of new currencies in places like China and South Korea, has gone from 1,400 uh, a year and a bit ago to 2,100, and the number of exchanges has gone from 7,000 or 8,000 to 16,000. So this is kind of like everybody setting up their own exchange of which Quadrigo would be one. Uh, the market cap, as you can see, is down quite dramatically from it's back to where it was early in 2017. And uh, uh, Bitcoin is back up representing around half of all volume traded. So you can go and, and you can go and see where, where all these coins are traded. Um, I mentioned that uh, the code for these is available and so people were able to create these coins, these altcoins, and sell them to the public and that regulators were, were um, pretty harshly against them. Okay. Now, the Ethereum platform uh, was set up by a um, by a Russian Canadian 19-year-old programmer who uh, used to be a big follower uh, of Bitcoin and published one of the first magazines that talked about Bitcoin. And he was an early he he realized early on that Bitcoin had some real limitations. And he just said, well, why don't we just change the block size? Why don't we just change you know, the scripting language to make it more complex? And uh, the Bitcoin community didn't like that. So he just said, well, I'll start my own coin. So he started the Ethereum network. And the coin that he uses on his network is called Ether. And his network is very different. He wanted to provide a platform online for people to run applications. Um, and that platform has uh, you know, different rules or protocols, um, and it allows something called smart contracts. 
what a smart contract is, is you can, he, he created, where Bitcoin is created with a scripting language that can only do around 200 things. It's a very simple programming language that, that is like send, receive, you know, updating. He wrote a new language for Ethereum called Solidity that can do almost anything. It is in fact a computing language that is so complete that it's called Turing complete after the inventor of the computer. Because you can program any kind of transaction you want. And what he wanted to do was be able to remove human intervention by allowing people to write computer contracts that would be locked in code, that would be encrypted, that would do simple things. You send money, the code recognizes that the money's been received, a product gets shipped. Okay. You send uh, the deed to your house, the money for the house sale goes back to you. And these smart contracts will allow if-then kind of transactions. They could be more complex. We could enter into a contract on the weather next week. We could write a smart contract that says, if the weather is below 20 degrees on average next week, according to this public source, you will send me one Bitcoin. That would be an example of a smart contract that we could we could enter into. But as you think about it, it could obviously be used for many different business applications. And what people have done is they've started creating tokens that are basically meeting that are built on the Ethereum network instead of on the Bitcoin network, okay, with many different use cases. And that is what is, has led to the, the huge growth in each of these is a coin. Their relative size is the amount of money that it was raised. You can see some of the biggest offerings are like the EOS token, which raised $4.2 billion. Okay. This, uh, this graphic, if you ever run it, it actually shows in real time the creation of all the coins. It's quite visual and kind of like, it kind of grows. Um, and you can't even find Ethereum here because the amount of Ethereum, the size of Ethereum is relatively small relative to some of these. So the total raise between January and August, January 2014, August 2018 was $28 billion. Okay, so um, Vitalik, um, who created Ethereum, he actually was a dropout student from the University of Waterloo, and after creating this, he moved to Switzerland because he found the regulatory environment in Canada was too oppressive. Switzerland has, uh, in, in particular, the town of Zug has decided that they want to be very welcoming to cryptocurrencies, and they don't tax them, they don't charge corporate tax, the authorities approve them, and they've become the new Silicon Valley for cryptocurrencies. It's called uh, Crypto Valley. Okay. And there's a website from the government of, of, of Switzerland, from Zug, inviting developers in the crypto space to move there. Okay. So the key thing to know about Ethereum is that it is, it is a blockchain that is programmable. <coughs> Meaning you can create some code, have it encrypt, hashed and encrypted, so that the code will run and nobody can mess with your code. Nobody can actually alter your code. Once you post it, it will be it is, um, it is secure and will run whatever it's supposed to run without somebody able to hack it. Okay? Now, people have built things on this network using Ethereum that were then hacked. Okay? But the code itself was never hacked. So the Ethereum network itself is secure, but if you build a, a weak house on a strong foundation, the house can still fall over. Okay? So, um, the network is available for free, but if you want to run anything on the network, you have to pay. So the idea is, like running a car on the streets, the streets are free to use, but you have to pay, you have to buy gas for your car. Okay? So if you want to run a program that's very simple, it will require very little ether or gas to run on the Ethereum network. And if you want to run something that's quite complicated, it'll, it'll just cost you more because he's basically charging for computing power because behind the scenes there's like computers, there's the cloud, there's programmers that all have to be paid, but it's a pay-as-you-go system. Okay? There's no limit to the number of ether that can be created. And in fact, they're getting away from mining of ether. 
as a way to verify transactions. They're moving from something called proof of work to something called proof of stake, where the largest holders of Ethereum will be able to take turns to verify transactions, and that will get away from all this computer power that's being used and, and all the waste that's associated with it. Yeah. Well, is it a bad thing that it has no limit to it? Well, the question is, what does that do to the value of one Ether? Yeah. Well, if you if they can create Ether whenever they want, it should put a cap on the price, right? Yeah. yeah. But they're not, you know, is there a limit to the number of Canadian dollars that the Canadian government can print? No, I don't think so. No. Uh, well, it's very analogous, right? Yeah. So the idea of, of the problem with the gold, the gold, the gold system where money was backed by gold, was that um, the amount of money in circulation was directly proportional to how much gold was being mined. And if the world economy was growing fast, and you weren't mining enough gold, you just didn't have enough currency in circulation. So we got away from this this restriction of gold. So Bitcoin is kind of like gold, 21 million. That's it. Like with the, but with Ethereum, yeah. they can create more Ethereum to meet demand. Okay, so. To keep the system able to grow okay. and scale with the, the number of users. Do you think Ethereum is more like, um, like stable? Like it's more like well, it's, it's, it's still, it's, it's, it's been subject to the same swings in terms of the price that uh, Bitcoin has been. And so some people have invented new coins that don't move in price. They're called stable coins. Right? And it, it's almost like we're getting back into the, the exact same system as fiat currency. Because now some currencies are pegged. Some currencies are floating. Uh, some currencies can be controlled where they can increase the volume. Unfortunately, with Bitcoin, you, there are five mining pools that control 75% of the computing power on the whole network. So it's no longer a decentralized you know, a system that where it's easy for individuals to, 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 to send money. It's not, no longer the vision that Satoshi had of uh, money for the people that was cheap and easy to transfer. So they're all going full circle. Yeah, so we're now back into a perverted system that looks very much like our current monetary system, where people are speculating on coins instead of gold or stocks. One thing to know about when, like, President Nixon took, um, U.S. currency, because all currency was based on U.S. currency, but it was based on gold. Yeah. They did that. That happened when France just suddenly came along and said, give me back my gold. Yes. Um, they did suck punch to U.S. and to the world, essentially. That's right. Nixon basically, you know, there had been a pledge that every every U.S. dollar was backed by, uh, it was $35 per ounce of gold. And during the Vietnam War and this big, you know, society project that they had in the United States, they just printed money until the amount of money in circulation was triple the amount of gold reserves that the U.S. had. And at that point, France said, hey, we are going to, we'd like to exchange all our U.S. dollars for gold. And uh, the U.S. government said, I, if everybody does that, we're, you know, we're in trouble. So they said no. They broke the, they broke the, the liquid gold that day. But some countries have actually bought up gold, so like there's still real value to it. Yeah. But if you think about it, gold's a funny thing. It's here, but it's not there. And it's not equally distributed around the world. So some people just happen to be sitting on it. Right? So, you know, you know, some countries have an advantage when it comes to mining Bitcoin. They just happen to have cold climates and cheap electricity. But that doesn't mean that it's not creating a lot of CO2 and a lot of greenhouse gases that everyone's going to have to deal with. Okay, um, what, time, uh, what time are we done?